So on these notes, let me introduce you the first pitching session that is organized in collaboration with Impact Hub. We've been working with the Hub for the last three years. Actually, the Social Good Summit started with Impact Hub, and we created jointly um, Accelerate 2030 to really bring concrete solution that would kick off the right conversation to advance the implementation of the, of the SDG. Um, and it's quite amazing what has been achieved in the last three years because we've been working with Impacta. We have worked with Impacta in more than, I think, in 19 countries, in developing countries. We have set up a pipeline of more than 500 entrepreneurs working on solutions for the SDG. And they just told me that if you, um, if you put all those numbers together, we managed to reach about one million lives, which is quite an achievement. Um, but where I'm really happy, you know, with all this work is that I see that this concept of working with entrepreneurs, sourcing entrepreneurs, helping them to, to scale up their solution specifically for the SDG is really gaining traction. And both within acceleration program um, and with investors. So I think there is a really, there, there's a momentum and it's the right time to all work together on scaling that, uh, that moment. So let me introduce our moderator of this session. Um, we're so happy to have Roland Dominicé, who is the CEO of Symbiotics, and Guillaume Dubré, managing partners at Politic Venture, to moderate the session. Uh, be aware, this is not a typical moderation. Uh, we ask them to work with the entrepreneurs, ask tough questions. We, we really want tough questions. We want the entrepreneur to benefit from your question so that they can reflect on the business model. And we, we really want an interaction. It's a pitch. It's not a conference. It's not a panel. Um, we don't have, I mean, the moderator will manage the time. We're already late, so I'm going to stop speaking. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you the floor. Okay. Um, it's, it's meant to be a little impro session, so we're, we're still fixing the logistics. <laughs> Uh, but welcome to everybody. I'm, I'm very happy um, to be here, to be, um, of course, a, a proud sponsor uh, yet for another time for the SGS in Geneva. Um, it, it's a very important uh, event for us. Um, Symbiotics is one of the leading um, impact investors worldwide. Um, I'm the CEO, one of the founders. Uh, the team is based here in Geneva. We have over 100 employees um, and growing, of course. But I'm not here to speak about Symbiotics. Um, I thought, um, as we were asked to moderate this panel, that I would team up with Guillaume Dubré, <laughs> one of our, our partners, um, and he would play the role of the mainstream investor, and I would play the role of the impact investor, <laughs> um, to help really, um, you know, uh, supposedly uh, coach for a couple of minutes uh, these entrepreneurs with uh, incredible ideas um, that came out as some of the leaders of the Accelerate 2030 program. Um, and so, um, Guillaume Dubré has a background um, in M&A and investment banking and has actually, as, a, as an entrepreneur himself, uh, started Polytech Ventures, uh, who's done over, I believe, 80 um, investments in startups, uh, technology startups in Europe, only in Europe. And myself, we've invested $4 billion uh, <coughs> across emerging and frontier markets, um, mostly doing uh, private debt working with development banks, also with grants, technical assistance. So we have a, a good mix, I think, of experience, um, and hopefully it'll be super interesting. So the way we'll do this <coughs> is we'll ask um, each entrepreneur for five, six minutes to present his story, um, and then we'll sit down and have a conversation. We'll, we'll kick off a couple questions, but it's really, uh, we're just moderators here, so it's really up to you um, to, you know, try to get to learn more, ask questions to the entrepreneurs, try to see um, if you're connected to specific SDGs, how they can contribute uh, to your goals and have a lively discussions. Okay? So, um, thank you. I'll pass it to Guillaume and we'll, we'll start with our first uh, entrepreneur. Thank you, Roland. So, we have five companies presenting out of the Accelerate 2030 Acceleration Program. Um, all companies coming from different countries with different projects. Um, so the objective is to have that pitch and then to circulate um, the, the mic uh, among you to have the opportunity to ask questions directly to the entrepreneur. 
Well, good morning, and <laughs> uh, thank you so much for uh, welcoming me here, welcoming Pitt Videra here. It's really an honor to kick off this session. Thank you to Credit Suisse, to Impact Hub, and to UNDP. It's an honor to be here. I'm Rachel, I'm from Pitt Videra, and we are creating the future of urban sanitation systems for the world. The world is rapidly urbanizing, and adequate sanitation systems are, is a crisis that's really looming over cities, um, especially cities that have rapidly expanding informal areas. The toilets, the sewer systems, and the wastewater treatment plants uh, of the past are not necessarily the solutions of the future, and this is especially true for low-income countries. Let's take Rwanda as an example. In Kigali, Rwanda, there is no sewer system, so households rely on a mix of pit latrines and septic tanks as their primary form of sanitation. And most households can't afford formal services once those facilities fill, which happens quite often due to flooding, high family sizes, um, and climate change, really. So when pit latrines or septic tanks fill, households have to hire manual pit latrine emptiers to empty their toilets. And these are workers who are marginalized in their communities. They perform the job with no improved tools, with no equipment. They do it in the dead of the night. It's illegal, and they're stigmatized. Um, the waste that they empty is dumped in the environment because there's no other option. This is an explosive violation of human rights, and it's, it has obvious public health and environmental health consequences. Now, when we talk about the SDGs for sanitation, there is a specific focus on the collection and the treatment components of the sanitation value chain. We've learned since the Millennium Development Goals that toilets are simply not enough. Now, we have a lot of organizations that are focusing on toilet provision, and we have amazing and incredible innovations in terms of converting human waste into value-added products. But what you need when you don't have sewer systems is a way to get from the toilet to the treatment center, from the, from, from the waste to uh, resource recovery products. And Pit Videra, uh, Pit Videra forms the link between those two parts of the value chain. Oh. So Pit Videra is a safe and affordable, I don't know why that slide, can't, you can't see it, but Pit Vidura is a safe and affordable emptying service that is available for low-income households in dense urban areas. So we train manual pit latrine emptiers to use our improved tools and equipment and provide safe and affordable services for low-income households. So we're turning stigma into pride and we're turning something that used to be very, very shunned in communities to something that can be viewed as heroic. We've developed the hardware that allows us to empty households even in the most inaccessible locations. A typical exhauster truck can only reach up to 10 meters from the road. We can reach households that are up to 200 meters from the roadside. We've also developed software that allows us to more efficiently, um, that allows our trucks to more efficiently access these areas and cluster households. Our efficiency gains lead to lower prices that more low-income households can afford. So we serve as an Uber, like the Uber for fecal sludge, connecting households that need services to trucks that are looking for places to serve. We are building the most robust fecal sludge management database in the world. And as every city expands, they're gonna be asking themselves how to build, run, and scale a sanitation system we have the data that is at the heart of all of those decisions. So far, we've served 900 households in Kigali. We are generating about $20,000 in revenue per year, and we've removed two million liters of waste from the urban environment, and this has prevented a public health disaster. And we've also seen that our technology has led to a 46% reduction in the operating costs of these typical exhauster trucks. This is not a problem that is just in Kigali. 
this is a problem that's all over the world in these rapidly expanding urban areas. We're looking to scale to three cities in East Africa by 2020. We have partners in Nairobi and Kampala and Blantyre that are, that are waiting for us to start working with them and we need help to scale. We need about a half a million dollars to start doing market research in these areas and get the and get new trucks and new service providers on the ground. We're also looking for expertise in logistics and help with multinational endorsements that'll allow us to work with key government partners. We have an international team that has experience from various different sectors. <laughs> Please join us as we create the future of urban sanitation for the world. Thank you. What made you start this project in Rwanda? We can hear from your accent that you're not a typical Rwanda person. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm an epidemiologist by training. I've been working in sanitation and public health for the better part of the last decade. Um, and I was working actually with a sanitation company that was converting human waste into solid fuel and they weren't getting the critical mass of feedstock that they needed to sustain a commercial operation. Um, so they hired me because in order to get that waste, they had to figure out how to get into the slums and get to the people where the waste was being generated. Um, in Rwanda, for example, 67% uh, of the population lives in informal settlements, um, and only 7% of the waste is actually managed by the existing exhaustor trucks. So all the waste is just trapped in the informal settlements, which happens to be an area of my expertise. And when was the company created? This was created, my company was created in uh, summer 2016. One area that's particularly interesting uh, for me to learn more about is, um, I, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a wonderful project, it has a, a very concrete um, impact, fulfilling a, a very basic um, need. Um, I think it's also addressing SDG 6, if I'm not mistaken, um, water and sanitation. Um, but then you, you, you get to the, the concrete part of the project, um, and it, you know, it's never about design, it's always about implementation. Um, what is your interaction with the local authorities uh, because obviously uh, you're filling up um, a gap uh, that they're not uh, providing apparently, uh, but at the same time it's a bit their turf, and so I'm sure there's interesting discussions. Um, maybe you can tell us more about that um, in, in your initial uh, experience. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we actually work directly with the Rwanda utilities provider, um, and you know I think they're really proud to have a very innovative solution like this in their city. Um, I was actually sitting in a meeting uh, the other week and we were talking about frameworks for, uh, for how to, to license new liquid waste managers that are coming into the market. And it was just so encouraging to see that um, within their framework they only allow specific types of technologies and specific types of actors and they put our technology as one of the things that they are looking to have not only us um, have only us provide, but have other service providers to start to uptake too. So that was really encouraging, um, and we work hand in hand with them and have been since day one. Okay. So, so, so it's actually a case where the public sector uh, welcomes uh, a sort of um, foreign initiated um, uh, idea that that came in. It's fulfilling a gap, trying to be self sustaining in a sense. And, and you'll tell us a bit more about your, your financial uh, model or, or goals, uh, but that they can sort of onboard and partner with. Um, and so there's, there's no resistance, but there's actually a welcoming to, to spread out in other potentially neighborhoods or cities. I mean, it didn't start off that way, but I think they saw that as we were growing traction, as we were growing our market reach, as we were the only ones who were providing this very necessary service to vulnerable populations, um, they were really interested in it. Thank you, Rachel. 
maybe turn the microphone to the audience. Good morning. <clears throat> you explained that you already have $20,000 of revenue um, on a run rate basis, I think. Can you go a bit more into detail on your business model? Uh, that was an annual run rate. Um, yeah, so households in, in formal settlements primarily hear about us either through the radio, through local community events, um, through community health workers at their clinic. Uh, we have various uh, ways that we reach our target market. Um, and when they need a service, they either text into our system, they call us, and we put them into our database and wait for a cluster in the neighborhood and deploy a truck to serve that cluster of households. Um, on average, it's about $95 per service. Households use the service once every seven to 10 years, give or take. Um, if they're a community in a low-lying area where pits fill fast because of high water tables, it's uh, more frequent, if that answers your question. <laughs> I'll go ahead. Um, Cheryl Hicks from the Toilet Board Coalition. Hi, Rachel. Congra Hi. Congratulations. <laughs> this is fantastic. Uh, collection is, is so needed. Um, my question is about um, uh, other revenue streams for you uh, diversifying from municipalities to corporates and corporate demand, for example, for sewage, for uh, waste to energy and, and, uh, and other waste to reuse options. Yeah, sure. So we're talking to some partners in Kenya that you probably know, like Sanovation and Sanergy, who are actively looking for ways to increase their feedstock. Um, so that's one potential partnership. I mean, like, theoretically, a, a, a successful resource recovery um, operation would pay for feedstock, right? So that's, I mean, in the long-term future. Um, in the shorter term, we're looking at licensing agreements, um, you know, licensing both our software and our hardware to existing service providers in different cities to increase the utility of these severely underutilized truck assets. Um, and we have just uh, launched a partnership with one service provider in Kampala, and um, we're building a relationship with, uh, with another in, in Blantyre and in Nairobi as well. Just time for one last question. Yeah, really quick one. Uh, what type of fuel uh, those trucks are using? And are you thinking about any uh, sustainable energy uh, for your trucks? Um, to date, no, but if you have some ideas around that, I would love to hear them. Unfortunately, the market for trucks in East Africa um, is not so great. So we're using very old fuel inefficient vehicles, which, um, you know, leads to high costs. So if there's uh, any ideas around that, um, that could, you know, lower our costs, decrease our carbon footprint, and bring our service within the reach of more low-income households, we would be very eager to hear about them. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you. Okay, I think we have the lineup right. I'm sorry, we, we actually had the order um, upside down. But um, I, I'd like to start with our, our second uh, entrepreneur. So I'll call Raphael Petit uh, from uh, Ecosys uh, Rainbow Ecosystems, um, an engineering company uh, in Ukraine. Um, you'll see fascinating, um, active in green building um, and trying, I, I guess, to leverage really um, across emerging and frontier markets with different partners. So you'll tell us about it and we'll have a good conversation afterward. Hello, my name is Raphael Petit. I have also an accent, but not from America. <laughs> I'm French and I live in Ukraine. I will talk to you about the story about weapon of mass construction. Maybe it remembers you something some years ago. I will tell you why we did it, how we run it, and what we need for the future. These guys are my family. Elias, Suleiman, Tiffany, and Emily. I am a father and grandfather of these guys. Before I was, uh, let's say, successful businessman with money, I pollute the planet, 
And now I start to understand, since I become older, that I need to do something maybe for the next generation, but positive legacy. What will be the pain of our children? Because it's also your children. It's not only my family. Climate change, energy, okay, I will not tell you what happened. Everybody knows that the boat is sinking and the orchestra continue to play. So we need to do something, really. I don't want my children, my grandchildren know this. Okay, where, where I can have an impact with my little person. 45% of human activity turn around the construction. Digging, transportation, transformation, and so on, until the destruction. It's also 30% of pollution. There is a risk, and there is an opportunity each time. I choose the second part. 250 billion meters square has to be built in the next 30 years. UN Habitat database. How we can build this quantity of billion meters square? We continue like this? I don't think so. You see, it's impossible to take off. <laughs> so, I invest all my fortune, all my time, my energy during four years. And I came in Ukraine with a wonderful team of engineer, architect. We spent 200,000 hours of R&D to make a maximum of mistake, to be owner of these mistakes, and the technology at the end. So, what we invent, on the basis of my previous job, we can build a car in two hours. So why not to build a house in two days instead of two years? But we have zero emission, zero waste, and zero near zero energy. Okay, I will tell you, not zero. We use wood, <coughs> bad wood, straw of rice, of wheat, and clay. This is high technology. So, 100% natural and local material, prefabricated, load-bearing, plastered product. This is some picture of horizontal and vertical eco blocks. We build 100 meters square in two days. We produce it in two days and we install it three days and install it in three days. So in theory, you can have a house in one week. Our product has several advantages. Lower energy to produce. We spend 200% less energy than concrete. And we use 20 times less of water. And we use also not clear water. It's healthier. You have zero EMF in our buildings. We have zero VOC emissions. And we have a natural pure air quality inside without any material, any energy. We are cheaper. Selling price usually minus 30% everywhere it will be produced. Energy consumption minus 400% than the level of norms of construction everywhere. We are better and stronger. We build it for five generations. A building in concrete, you have to destroy it after 100 years because you have corrosion. We don't use these chemical products. Cleaner and healthier. 100 meters square of our building, it's 35 tons in prison for five generations. It's certified. Fire resistance, healthcare, mechanical resistance, and under the norms of construction. This is example, real example of what we have done. 
we built already 3,000 meters square, and now we have orders for around three times like this. This is a worldwide phenomenon. We are not alone. You can find it, this kind of building everywhere. Our unit of production is unique and replicable. Now we start to deal with Germany, Poland, Kazakhstan, and so on and so on. We have demand everywhere. We want to create a worldwide network of 1,000 production units. Only if we take 0.01% of the market worldwide, it's 20 million meters square by year. We have weakness, lack of image, nuf nuf naf naf nif nif, <laughs> are our best enemies. And the cost of certification everywhere. You can imagine that the lobby will not give up. So, we need to succeed more and to become mature, adult. First, I don't need money. I'm not here to ask you money first. We need clients. We need orders. We need organic growth. And then, we need faithful, long-term investor with human value. Don't send me an army of analysts and so on. <laughs> you will not be welcome. <laughs> so, what we need? Nothing. 9 million euro. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have it on you today. So we need to scale the production unit. We need to develop the marketing and sales, which is a weakness for us. And we need a fab lab to educate people to continue R&D <laughs> in good conditions. And we need uh, also to test the building with all our visitors in our own, let's say, guest house. I don't like hotel or model houses. <laughs> it's the last slide. So if you are excited by this, you can join me whenever you want. Thank you. OK, Raphael, it's really a, an incredible project. Um, and, and I must say, we're, you're really sitting on something that uh, looks like an incredible solution that um, has the power to scale. And, and you seem to be the right person to be able to deploy that. Um, and um, I think as we were talking um, yesterday, preparing a bit the session, it's true, you, and you put it very clearly here, um, you, you have the right solution, so you have the luxury uh, maybe picking the type of funders or partners um, that you would like. And it, you, you gave us a pretty good statement of, you know, you have an idea of what kind of investor you would like. <laughs> um, and I think that's key, um, because it's true. Um, um, it, it's not, you know, it's not only of having a, um, a good idea on the asset side of your business and then going um, to, you know, very, really tough investment banks, because it might not click. Um, and, and it's good you have that, that insight. But of course, I, now I'd like to learn more about it. And how would you visualize um, what um, a good investor or a good financial partner means for you, uh, given that you have this power of having the luxury of choice, maybe? OK, I have told you I invest all my fortune because it's for my children and my grandchildren. I would like to receive help from people who understand what I have done and who is ready to do the same. Is it clear? Yeah, but <laughs> may, may, maybe one follow-up on that. So you're expecting nine million of funding with somebody who is not doing any analysis, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, um, anyway, so it, it, you know, it'd be interesting to hear more. I think there's a range, and that's what's interesting in impact investing is um, there's not just one risk return type investor, there's a range and a blend of different um, type of partners. Um, and there are firms um, who are not mainstream investment banks, but who are advisory boutiques uh, who can definitely help you, guide you to the right type of partners, whether it's long-term equity 
stakeholders, or um, but at least you have a clear plan. So um, I, I think it's a very interesting discussion, but I, I'd like to open it up to the, uh, the audience to see if there's any specific points um, or people who are actually in this space and, and want to challenge also some of the, the assumptions in the presentation. Yes, um, in, in the middle. Yes, hello, I'm Marilyn from BetterWest. We are a crowdfunding platform for uh, resource-saving projects. I think you don't need so much the money, but um, it would interest me from the technical point of view if your product fulfills all energy standards of Europe so far. So, for example, in Germany we have the ENEF um, regulation, so you must have a building that saves or consumes a certain amount of energy. So does your product already fulfill this, or would you implement that market by market? Um, the standard of regulation evolutes all time. And today, we are much upper than the standard. Um, the product is, we don't need to do nothing. It's the product is like this, we just compress through in wood, and we obtain the result. It's magic, but um, the regulation is, uh, if you ask me if we are on the level of regulation of Europe, I can say yes in theory, but not in practice, because they ask dozens of thousand uh, euro each country to regulate the entrance on the market. That's it. The barrier is not in the product, it's in the laws. This product, we don't invent it. It's 7,000 years. We just invent the process. But each time we talk to, uh, let's say, an investor who wants to make a school, uh, 100 houses, what, whenever is it? Even in, K in uh, Saudi Arabia, we have 20,000 meters square to build a luxury hotel. The first thing which stops us, this is regulation. And it's done for that. We cannot go ahead without to take off the barrier. I was invited by the Minister of Ecology of France, who is giving up now, right? He asked me, what do you want? I said, keep your dogs, take off the barrier, and we can go on the market. He said, I cannot do this. You have to go to the parliament. You see? I answer to your question. <laughs> we, uh, we have a question in the front row here. Um, Hello. Uh, congratulations for the project. It's great. Um, my name is Ricardo. I've been working with Recycled a lot. And uh, my question goes, what made you uh, make these houses of straw and not plastic? I've heard uh, a lot of plastic concrete and similar ways. So why go this way and not other ways? Uh, I never thought about this. Maybe I need to think about this. No, natural product gives you health. If you start to live in plastic, you will become like, uh, I don't know, something dead inside. It doesn't breathe. Plastic is not the right way to, to live. Uh, do you wear uh, skin? Um, what do you say? Uh, you, you wear clothes in plastic? Y did you try? <laughs> the house is our third skin. This skin has to breathe. If it doesn't breathe, forget it. Use plastic for, I don't know what. I answer to your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, Tom. time for maybe a last question. I know there's a lot. Um, yes? Yeah, hi. Um, you over here. Um, being only 30% cheaper than traditional construction material, it's a head-to-head comparison. Wouldn't you say it's not for the developing world, it's for the developed world? Because it's not enough savings, 30% is not really relevant savings to take this technology below the equator. Thank you. Um, okay, it's your opinion. When you have an investment of 10 million euro and you pay it seven, it starts to be relevant, first. Uh, second, we can sell much more expensive than the market. It's just a choice of clients. We have clients who want luxury houses they buy it more expensive than the market because they are in a rich country. If you are able to do less, you can do more. 
our strategy is to be able to sell to poor people and even not sell. Give them access to our technology for free. I feel a little bit like Robin Hood, you know? I take to the rich to give to the poor. That's why I'm in Geneva. <laughs> I, I'm not hidden. Thank you very much, Raphael. <laughs> okay, unfortunately, we have to move on, but a big, a big applause again to Raphael. Um, they'll all be here at the stands if you want to ask more questions. I, I think it's a wonderful example, again, uh, as we saw just before with Pete Vidura, of, there's a great solution, uh, but often the regulatory environments uh, make it very complicated because there's... Um, you know, 200, 200 different regulatory environments, um, and it's sometimes hard to deploy. So, uh, thanks for sharing. Guillaume, our next uh, Our next is M. Gov from Brazil. Uh, please welcome Guilherme. Good morning. Um, my name is Guilherme, and I'm co-founder and chairman at M. Gov, a Brazilian startup doing ground, groundbreaking work to change the way we think about SDG4, quality of education. So I want to take you through the journey of Vera. She's a public school teacher in Brazil, you know, teaching math classes to teenagers, and she's very passionate about her job. But no surprise, she has very limited tools to make her classes more engaging and appealing to this new generation, so they don't learn that much. Now, I'm sure... Several of you guys sitting on the audience, investors, my fellow entrepreneurs, foundations, uh, would like to, and often do, provide people like Farah with better tools to make her classes better and improve the quality of education. One example is Khan Academy, the world's leading platform for online learning. So you think that you bring these tools such as that to help Vera do a better job and we improve quality of education. Now, perhaps you'd be surprised that often what happens is the exact opposite. Vera feels isolated, frustrated, because she doesn't feel she gets enough support to adopt the technology or, you know, more, more generally, best practices in the classroom, and often ends up creating resistance to adopting these best practices and technologies. Often learning gets even worse. So, what's the source of this problem? You know, you would think, that maybe Vera is not interested in improving the quality of education, she's perhaps lazy, she has tenure, she doesn't want to put effort into making her classes better, adopting these technologies there. But it would be wrong to think that. It's not that Vera doesn't want to do it. You know, she often makes plans to go online, learn more about Ken Academy and all these resources, think how she could incorporate those things into her lesson plans, but it's just that she often fails to follow through on those plans. It's a failure of the last mile, a behavioral problem. And when we fail to recognize that that's the case, we're not only failing Vera, okay, and all the people like her. Most importantly, we're failing the future of all her students. So I can sympathize. I mean, I identify with Vera. I'm a teacher myself. And you know, six years ago, when I started thinking about this problem, I got together with two co-founders and a strong team to try to tackle what we thought was the real root behind that problem this last mile issue, the behavioral failure to follow through on her plans. So I want to tell you what we have achieved. You know, now, six years later, we have a solution with a proven impact in a randomized controlled trial led by Stanford University. We've shown that our solution can impact the key KPIs for quality of education. It improves students' attendance, learning, it decreases grade repetition rates by such a large extent that we have a, over 1,000% return on investment for educational systems. We have over 200,000 active users supported by strong partners that helped us scale beyond Brazil across four different continents, including Ivory Coast that we heard earlier today. So now that I have your attention, I wanna tell you how we do it, what our solution actually looks like. So, to do that, you have to merge two concepts that in principle are very different. One is chatbots. I'm sure everyone heard of that. These are these little robots aimed at automating customer service. So we have to put that concept together with that of nudges. So nudges come from behavioral science. It's these little reminders or encouragement messages that are meant to make things top of mind, to change behavior, to form new habits. 
So what happens when you put chatbots together with nudges? You get a new concept, nudgebots. So nudgebots are also robots, but they're not for customer services. They are for habit formation, for changing behaviors that are hard to change. They have to be simple, insistent, autonomous. And we're the world's first startup providing nudgebots to improve the quality of education. So that's our bot, Educ Plus, for engaging teachers, parents, and students in, in, for improving children's education. How does it work? Well, we don't sell it to Vera, okay, and people like her. We sell it to governments, foundations, institutes, and big corporations doing CSR initiatives. Those uh, stakeholders purchase the solution, and it's as cheap as 25 cents of a dollar per student per month, or two dollars per teacher per month, and then once they are powering the solution, we deliver the nudges directly to the end users, taking advantage of clients' reach. The nudges arrive directly on the user's cell phones. You know, this is very simple. It starts with a motivating fact. A few days later, they receive a suggested activity. A couple of days later, an interactive message, which is two-way communication. We get teachers' inputs as well. And then it ends with a growth message that's meant to say, don't do it just this week, do it every week. It seems very simple. But behind it, there is behavioral science and there is artificial intelligence. So we use what we call the anti-apps, okay? SMS and automated voice calls. Why? Because we need to reach everyone. And for behavior change, that's actually the best. Those technologies come pre-installed in every phone. You cannot uninstall them and you cannot turn off push notifications. This is crucial for behavior change. If you compare what we do to the competition, I mean, we're the only startup in Latin America and Africa using the right technology to do that. And even in a super connected country like the US, the best companies you know, improving communication between educational systems and teachers and students are using SMS and voice because we need to reach everyone. You know, so Vera started in her journey with you know, isolation and resistance. She starts receiving the nudges. And eventually, she feels more motivated and supported. Only six months later, we already can see impacts. She understands how technology and best practices can help her, and she finally follows through on her plans. So we want to bring the right to education to all those children with the help of the right technology. For that, we need support. So we need strong partners that can take us to more markets and more clients. That means governments, foundations, institutes, big corporations that can power these solutions to help teachers and students solve this last mile problem. And this could al also mean investors. I mean, we've always bootstrapped, okay? Last year, we made 700,000 US dollars in revenues, always reinvesting those profits into our operation. We never fundraise. But this time, we're fundraising for the first time. We are in our first round, already $800,000 in. And perhaps we could also discuss how that could help us scale our impact more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kiyame. Maybe can, I, can you, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about your go-to-market strategy and you know, how it all started from zero customer to today with 200,000 active users? Right, so six years ago, we started a, almost like a consultancy firm, right? We wanted to help government better communicate with citizens, to listen to, the, to their demands more timely, to understand their evaluation of public services. But then three years on, we realized we were super underutilizing the communication channel. We could use it not just to listen to the citizens, but also to send them information or nudge them for behavior change. So we started with a Brazilian foundation called Lemon Foundation. Uh, to do this with parents. So they supported us to reach first 2,000 parents, mm -hmm. and that's how we went. And then in this, you know, we, we could show that we could actually change behavior, so we, got, we captured public attention. So from 2,000 parents, the following year, we already grow, we grew to 31,000 through you know, local companies that wanted to power this as a corporate social responsibility action for their employees. The next year, 150,000 because we already started moving to West Africa, and then this year we're 200,000, but I mean, this is just a tiny bit. Yeah. Brazil has you know, 40 million uh, students in, in just in public schools. If we go just to Ivory Coast, it's four million. So we could be doing, we're just scratching the surface. With the right help, we could be doing much more. And it's very cheap. You saw that, I mean, the rate, the return on investment is huge. So it's like an arbitrage opportunity, okay? If we could just give the right tools to the right people, 
All of a sudden, we can reap these impacts and improve education. So you said that you were raising 800,000, right? What would be the use of that capital? So we were aiming at 1 million. We have 800K already in. And it's half for the technology roadmap. So now to really scale, we've got to make sure that the messages are delivered timely, that you know, we're really making the best use of artificial intelligence to customize the messages and so on. So our dev team has to increase infrastructure and so on. So half of the proceeds are for that. The other half is for marketing and sales because scaling across continents is hard and we need local people with the right team. How many languages do you cover today? So, good question. Uh, in Brazil, of course, it's just Portuguese. It makes it easy. Now, when we go to Ivory Coast, it's already 60 dialects, right? And so it makes it super hard. So currently, we're doing Portuguese and Spanish. And then in Ivory Coast, we're doing French, but two local dialects. And then we're scaling slowly because it's hard to incorporate all dialects. So you have to do it uh, phased. Any question in the audience? Obviously, you caught the attention of, Gu of Guillaume here, I think, as, <laughs> as a tech venture capitalist, um, and the, the crowd is silent. I, I think it's, uh, it, it, what's, what strikes me, actually, is that uh, you said you, you, you started on your own, meaning that you didn't need any um, you know, startup financing to launch this. Um, did, did you actually code the initial system yourself or with a couple of friends? And, and, and the one million is enough to actually roll out uh, across several countries now? So we started basically taking advantage of solutions that were available in the market. Mm -hmm. So it took us a very long time to actually bring technology to the core. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning we were using, you know, UNICEF has developed Rapid Pro, which is a great system for SMS and voice. So, I mean, we waited as long as we could until we brought technology to the center. But at some point, you know, it becomes so key to the operation that it, it's got to be brought in. And that happened at the moment where we had enough revenues to be able to do that on our own. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it, it was a fantastic uh, case, I think, of, I mean, I, I barely put money in. I think mm -hmm. in the whole history of the organization, maybe I put $10,000 in. Mm -hmm. So it was really that we, the organization was born to serve such a real need that we had revenues for, from day one. Mm -hmm. So that was great. Now, is one million enough? I mean, I don't know. With more resources, we can always do more and be more ambitious and scale our impact faster. Mm -hmm. But that was just a first goal that we put for fundraising. And then hopefully if more resources are available in good terms. But more important for us is really smart money. So beyond resources, it's really access to more markets and expertise to help us do deeper impacts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That could, of course, help a lot. Okay. Hi, uh, Sofiane Vadim Fidoum from Green Tech Capital. Love what you do. I have a question about would it work also with any kind of training, vocational training for adults uh, at a later stage in life? Great question. So this is one nudge bot that we have, but we also have other nudge bots. So one that's you know getting some traction now as well is one that we call Safe Plus. It's for financial education. So. It could also work for vocational training and so on. The, the key is, I mean, this is a tool for delivering content, sure. But most importantly, it recognizes that it's not just about information. It's really about being insistent and making it top of mind and forming habits and so on. So to the extent that it's social impact, we're happy to take it on and you know, bring the best of behavioral science to actually change, help these last mile problems. Any last points? Um, maybe, maybe just as a closing uh, remark, and maybe you can uh, give us your thoughts. Um, you're also an example um, of something that's um, extremely powerful and, and happening much more than we can imagine here in, in Geneva. Um, you know, th this is a, a Brazilian-born company that has tremendous success. Um, goes out apparently to Stanford, Silicon Valley, to present its success, uh, get some partners, but more importantly. Um, that's spreading out in a, in a lateral manner south-south. Um, and so it's really a, a Brazil to West Africa uh, story right now, and I'm sure it's going to expand. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? Um, you know, how, did you, well, how did you start in Côte d'Ivoire? What, what was uh, the interaction? 
um, and, and really a, a change of partners uh, compared to maybe, um, you know, historically Europeans or French and Chinese coming in, but now it's really Brazilian technology is, is making a change in uh, education um, in, in Côte d'Ivoire, as an illustration. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm so happy that we're finally working in Africa. I mean, that was always a dream. And it's true, I mean, it's fantastic that it's a uh, technology coming from the developing world to the developing world. But curiously, it only happened because of Switzerland. Because this is powered by Jacobs Foundation. And they do such a fantastic job in Ivory Coast putting all the resources together. And, uh, you know, uh, scoping the best solutions that are working in similar contexts and then bringing it to help the cocoa uh, growing regions in Ivory Coast. That's, I mean, there's this fantastic, important link in the background. They, you know, they're not in the forefront, but in the background they're making this happen. So Switzerland plays an important role there as well. Okay. Um, so you, you're doing like Rafael, you're coming in Geneva to get the... <laughs> Uh, the money and bringing it down there. So anyway, a big applause again. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, our, we have 25 minutes to go, so we're, we're just about on time. Uh, we'll spend um, the next 10, 15 minutes with uh, Diana Quintero from Colombia. So uh, welcome to you. Uh, she's going to tell us about her uh, enterprise. Um, active in um, affordable healthcare in Colombia, how it started and how she's trying to expand uh, across the country. Thank you. Good morning, I am Diana Quintero, CEO and co-founder of Vive, a social business that facilitates access to healthcare services for Colombia's low-income population. So I was raised in a farmer family and it was through their experience that I really know what it means for a rural family access to healthcare services in Colombia. I am so I am pretty sure that all of you. I am pretty sure that all of you have health coverage, but does it insurance mean to have access to healthcare services in Colombia? No, because although 95% of population have access to health insurance, but long waiting times, administrative procedures, and also lack of quality mean that poor family cannot access to timely healthcare services. And specialized services are centralized in low in big cities, and also the roads are in bad conditions, which create bigger gaps for rural communities. And we don't need to be doctors to understand an early diagnosis could be the difference between life and death. So she's Luz Elena. She's a coffee grower and a, can a cancer survivor. She has been waiting five months for to a consultation with a mastologist. And she has done all the administrative procedures that she requires for access to those kind of services. That means a lot of forms and a lot of phone calls. And she is, and the system is still don't provide the service that she requires. And in the other side, He's Walter. He's a doctor and satisfied with the restrictions of quality and the delay of almost two or three months to be paid for their services. And what if there was a platform that connects Luz Elena and Walter directly? So, Vive is a low cost membership service that provides high quality and affordable and timely services for low-income communities in Colombia. Through Vive, Luz Elena call access to a huge network of healthcare providers that could provide services faster and better quality than regular health system. And also, uh, at affordable price for our users. So Luz Elena paid just $20 per consultation uh, compared with $60 of this service in the price market. And on the other side, Walter receives a higher volume of patients. 
uh, with fair payment and on time because our users pay directly to the healthcare providers. Luz Elena is part of a coffee grower cooperative. So the farmer association buy directly the service or the vive membership for her and also they accomplish their social, their social mission or their social impact. To give our social impact with communities, we create allies with farmer associations, healthcare providers, and also international partners to bring closer those kind of specific services for low-income communities in the rural Colombia. So examples of that are Vision Cafetera, in partnership with Pfizer Foundation, we have improved the health, the eye health of more than 200, uh, 200 uh, coffee growers in Colombia, providing early diagnosis and detection and also treatment for uh, visual illness as catarata, glaucoma, and pterygia. Right now, we have 21,000 users across two regions of Colombia. Our vision is to be the best alternative for access to healthcare services for low-income communities. So we need to expand our vision to the whole country. And we, ca we could leverage our partnership with coffee growers for do it. It means an, at least a, a market of two million users. For do it that we need first, to improve our IT, IT platform, commercial channels, and also improve the value proposition for healthcare providers. And second, we need also to expand, we need also to expand the social impact of our social projects. Uh, basically, um, it means to improve the diagnosis of breast and cervical cancer for rural women in Colombia through telemedicine technology. What we need, we need first funding in total around $300,000, an IT and a strategy partner, and also clients that it not mean just farmer associations in Colombia. It means also you, companies that have a provider in the agriculture sector in Colombia. Join us to our purpose. Everyone can enjoy of the highest attainable level of healthcare regardless of level of, inc of income. I will be happy to discuss with you our expansion plans. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you so much, uh, Diana. It's a, it's a wonderful case, I think, with a lot of success. There, there's a lot of um, nice brands here, I must say, and a, a signal of, of what you've been able to achieve and, and to attract all sorts of uh, blended finance or, or impact investors. Um, it, it, it's, again, striking to me always when we talk about the, the, the SDG link to health, uh, how much it's a public sector issue, again, um, as maybe for education and, and water and so on. Um, obviously, a sector that's more prone to, to have a, a growing presence of the private sector involved. Um, tell us a bit about, um, you mentioned LGT Ventures, who's actually a venture capital fund, of course, impact investing, but still venture capital. Um, for for the, um, the the sort of uh, teeth um, aspect of things, and then for the eyes, you work with uh, Pfizer. Um, did they provide you a grant, a loan? Um, are they actually shareholders now of your business? And are you trying to replicate the same type of relationships? Or now that you want to roll out uh, through a digital solution, um, you want different type of partners? So. Through social, so, excuse me, through social projects, what we're trying to do is like to deep the social impact that VIVE mem membership have in the rural communities. So we engage the partners, that is farmer associations, our healthcare provider network, and also those kind of international partners as you can also improve or a strong our value proposition with the whole stakeholders or the value chain of BIM. Mm -hmm. So 
Uh, we have, through Pfizer Foundation, a grant program which can help to support the finance or the funding of those kind of projects. But it doesn't mean just charity, because what we do, it's like the Farmer Association, they co-fund the project, they serve as a channel for to have a huge impact, and also this creates a vision about what we are doing, and with, for example, five Pfizer Foundation project that we started just the last year, we have a new market of around 6,000 users because farmer foundations say as an opportunity to co-fund those kind of projects uh, with fair trade funds that they need to, uh, to improve the social metrics in their population and they have to show results also to the fair trade certification. So those kind of funds that could be charity for more of you, it really creates an impact in the way that we are related with all of our value chain. So uh, that's, a, the mo that's as important for us to have those kind of projects and also to provide other kind of services directly to the community. I can see how it's a very vernacular project and very attractive to, to these different funders. You? Thank you. I really like your project because it's both beneficial to uh, the patient as well as to the doctors who get paid quicker. Uh, I was just wondering about the overall model. How does that work? Are you actually affiliated to one insurance company? Or are you paying the doctors for the whole treatment that he did based on the subscription that you get from your customers. How does the model work? Our revenue streams is based on the membership. So it is a low cost membership that is just $3.5 per year per person. But for example, when we approach to a huge farmer association, uh, the coffee grower cooperatives in Colombia, it means just through one client to have at least 800,000 uh, of coffee growers that are part of, of, the, of the service. So real, uh, the payer is the farmer association. And they don't pay for the use of the service. This is like a membership that could be like a health care insurance in that way, but uh, the final user pay directly to the to the uh, to the doctor, but with at a price that it's affordable for them. So they decrease the price uh, the price per uh, per consultation, but they have a higher volume of patients. So what we do is like we create a marketing channel for those kind of private uh, healthcare services. Let's open it up maybe to the audience for a couple of minutes. Any specific angle on, on healthcare uh, that you want to share on? Yes? In the middle. Hello. Uh, congratulations for your project. I'm from Honduras, so I can empathize with this. Uh, our uh, healthcare system is collapsed, so every time someone needs uh, a consultation, it takes around three months, like you mentioned. And uh, we have a big problem in surgery aspects. So I was wondering if you were uh, planning to expand instead of just consultation to surgery sessions or any type of other medical services, because in our in our case, let's say, uh, it's it's a need the government is not providing, like you mentioned. So I was thinking if the people who pay the membership still use uh, public healthcare systems or they dropped it completely. That's a really good question. So how we have, how we have to approach to this problem? So uh, the first thing is like the main issue in Colombia to access to healthcare services is the diagnosis. So after that, we have a second uh, social service, or a second service that it's uh, called social orientation or that like it's a legal advisory. Try through, we try to create a bridge between the diagnosis that the person have through our system and the public health system. So this is the way that we can uh, to continue 
all of high complex uh, chronic medication or surgeries that people require. Also through social projects as Pfizer Foundation funding Vision Cafetera, we uh, try to go to a specific uh, needs as for example, this project includes the diagnosis and also the treatment of visual illness as cataract pterygium or glaucoma that requires also a surgery intervention. And in some cases also, we have a partner with coffee grower cooperatives and they also provide fund as credit through the coffee grower uh, for to have those kind of high complex uh, surgeries that they require. But in the future, we would like to provide those kind of services, maybe through credit or maybe to fund or fund partly of them. Thank you. Um, we're a bit um, uh, late, but is there any last comments uh, for Diana? Um, again, I will, will be at the stands afterwards, so um, a big applause to you, maybe. Um, thank you again. Thank you, Dinah. Now it's time to welcome uh, Francis again. <laughs> Hello again. Uh, it's, it's good to be back again. <laughs> My name is Francis Obrikrai, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of AgroCenter. So in the next five to six minutes, we are going to talk about an innovative solution that is creating value for millions of smallholder farmers across Ghana and Africa eventually. About two years ago, my co-founder and I, after walking away from our first field startup, we decided to venture into agriculture because we were both from an agricultural growing areas. We took a trip across the entire length and breadth of the country. We spoke to several farmers to understand the need and some of the problems they face. We spoke to farmers such as Salama to Abdullahi, who is a 53-year-old farmer. She's married, she has six kids. Some of her key frustrations was one, one she had difficulty to find access to market to sell. Secondly, she was recording low sales because she had to sell to predatory middlemen. And finally, she had little access to credit, so she could not move away from her typical one acre to more of an agribusiness. These problems are very pervasive across the country and across Africa. But out of these problems comes a solution. We created AgroCenter, which is the first full-fledged technology platform that connects smallholder farmers to a structured market to trade. Businesses, on the other hand, can source for local raw materials from these smaller farmers at a cheaper, better, and a faster rate. Businesses no longer need to import raw materials to, to boost their production. Farmers like Salama now can also sell to these businesses at fair market prices. At the core of our operations are three impacts. One, we are looking at no poverty. So farmers like Salamatu now can increase from the typical $1 a day to $4 a day. Secondly, we are looking at no hunger, zero hunger, where we are looking at good distribution of food across the country to reduce post-harvest losses. Finally, we are looking at how Salamatu can increase from the one acre, where she produces a typical about one metric ton to about 2.5 metric tons. Why are we doing that? We are moving her from, the typical, from a typical subsistence farming to an agribusiness. The agricultural market space in Africa is enormous. It's estimated to be worth one trillion by 2030. Agriculture employs more than 62% of Africa's workforce. And out of that, more than 90% are smallholder farmers. This presents an enormous opportunity for AgroCenter to scale beyond the borders of Ghana and serve the millions of smallholder farmers across Africa. We started two years ago. We currently have five major off-take contracts with companies such as Diageo, looking to sign up Nestle. We are making a $50,000 monthly recurring revenue, working with 30,000 small other farmers. We are active in four regions out of 10 regions in Ghana and looking to scale beyond that. In 2020, we are looking to move to the next biggest market, which is Nigeria, where we target a $10 million, $10 million small other farmer population. 
we are not alone in this space. We have competition, of course. Competition always brings efficiency. But our solution makes us, given the last mile access to farmers, provide cheaper, better, and faster solutions, and we beat competition to the ground. We are not an NGO, even though we have a core of our impact at our, of, of our operations. We make a third, we're a B2B company. We make a 30% commissions on trade volumes we facilitate on behalf of these large organizations who typically will have to import commodities into the country. Over the last few years, we've raised a total of close to about $800,000. We are looking to scale. We are now in the Series A round raising $4 million, which is going to give us access to continuous working capital, product development, grow the demand and the supply side, where we're looking at serving about 100,000 smaller holder farmers within the next three years. From a team that started as two co-founders, we've grown over time. I am Francis O'Brien, the CEO and co-founder. Michael Kanse, who is the CTO and co-founder. And we have expert advisory services from our investors, from Seedstars, Green Tech Capital Partners, etc. And also we have 30 agents on the ground who interface directly with these smaller farmers because our farmers typically are either literate, illiterate or semi-literate and cannot use basic technology. We have agents who work with them to onboard them on the platform. We have extensive partner network, both local and international, who are contributing in diverse ways for us to be able to scale. <coughs> the next revolution in agriculture started in Ghana. It's looking to make wave even to Europe. So if you're an investor with a deep pocket, yeah, we also like shallow pockets. <laughs> if you're a trade organization looking to source for commodities for your local production, come talk to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Uh, let, let me start with a provocative uh, question. So you're building a very nice marketplace, right, that is basically connecting local producers with buyers uh, with the objective to disintermediate the middleman who, uh, who is taking too much of a commission. But to my knowledge, community traders do not take 30% of commission. It seems to me like a big, big commission you take in the middle. So how, how does that work? Uh, they take more than 30%. So let me give you a typical scenario. So if middlemen buy from farmers, even they buy at below market prices. So even let's say if the market price for let's say a standard 100 kilogram of maize is about $20. These middlemen buy sometimes between 12 to $10. And then they bring it to the urban areas and even resell for sometimes as high as $30. So they make astronomical profits, sometimes even about 130%, even more than that, at the expense of the smallholder farmer. Also, if businesses need to import commodities to the country, a typical, let's say, Diageo is importing, let's say, sorghum for the production, a typical kilogram cost costs them about $2.5 per kilogram to import these barley from South Africa into Ghana. If they source locally, they are looking at $1.60. Even plus our commissions of 30, we are even getting about, let's say, $1, about 90 cents, which eventually save them a lot of money. So yes, there's a lot of commodity prices, volatility, et cetera, but this is actually saves them a lot of time and money and also very cheaper. Thank you. And one of the key success factors of a marketplace like yours is to be able to scale up both sides of the marketplace, right? Mm -hmm. From the producer and the mm -hmm. buyer. Mm -hmm. How are you doing this today? Yeah, so we are more of demand driven. What we basically do, as I mentioned, we've signed up five of the contracts. We are looking to increase that to 10. So once, you, once we typically sign up an off-taker, we sign a minimum of a 12-month contract. That tells us that they, on a monthly basis, they need about, let's say, 200 metric tons, 500 metric tons of commodities. Once we know the number of tons that is needed across a 12-month period, we backward integrate that into the number of farmers we work with. So once the demand goes up, the supply also goes up. So that is how we are able to manage expectations on the platform. Question from the audience? I think it's a fantastic model, and um, being an investor in a number of agri-tech companies and traders, it's quite interesting. But on the aggregation side, where actually you're talking about the likes of Diageo, for them to get the right scale of product, who actually provides the aggregation of all the commodities in the middle? Because that's key, if, particularly if you're looking at smallholder farmers. Okay. So thank you very much. So we provide aggregation also. So at the core of our operations also, we have a lot of on-ground operations. We work through network of agents. We have uh, what we call the aggregation sites that are a typical 
a warehouse that can hold a, at least about a 10,000 metric ton of commodity. So we are involved in commodity sourcing, quality control, product batching, logistics, until they get to the final destination, so the typical farm to fork approach. Any other question? I'm, I'm looking at the time, We're, it's just 10.15. We, we started a bit late, so I, maybe we have some time for two, three questions, yes? Just a short question. Uh, how do you work with the individual farmers? How do you find them and support them? And how do you plan to scale that? Thank you. So we are mostly community-based. As I mentioned, we have on-ground agents who typically go to these communities. So once we go to a community, there's more of a community sensitization seminar we do. There's a lot of onboarding. Farmers are put in cooperatives, ideally for cooperatives, because we want strength in numbers uh, to be able to serve these farmers. So that is how the farmers, that, that's how we reach out to the farmers through the community level, through the network of agents who, who work with them. And to scale, yes, we are looking at uh, also, because most of the farmers, as I mentioned, are either semi-literates or illiterate, we are looking at also expanding the agent network, expanding the community so that we want to work in. Eventually, that's going to triple the number of farmers we work with. Okay. Um, any, any last thoughts? Uh, again, Francis will be at, at the stands. Um, uh, of course, a, a fascinating topic, probably the most important one. Uh, and the most difficult one uh, to tackle for, for private sector investors. Um, and so d definitely uh, fascinating. Um, thanks a lot, Francis. Thank <laughs> um, maybe just as a, as a closing remark, I'm, I'd really like to, to thank again um, Maria Luisa Silva of UNDP for orchestrating this. Um, it's a bit of a show, but definitely uh, also Sarah Bell and her team um, what we try to show here is really uh, what the Geneva ecosystem can do. Uh, we have the UNDP as an enabling environment. Uh, we have the Impact Hub uh, working on Accelerate 2030. Uh, we have other incubators um, like Fusion, more on the mainstream capital side, like Seedstars was cited. Um, you may know it or not, Francis, but Seedstars brought um, AgroCenter to Symbiotics. Uh, we're closing a fund uh, in December about 50 million to start with um, doing SDG integration. Um, so really uh, applying the, the SDG framework, <coughs> sorry, to an, an investment strategy and um, the investor wants a lot of different things but he wants five or six wow deals. That's how he <laughs> uh, defined them. And um, um, AgroCenter was shortlisted but um, I, I'd love of course to have a discussion uh, with Diana, with Guillerme, uh, with you, um, Raphael, or with Rachel or others and I think that's one of the things um, uh, where Geneva stands out, is having this capacity to have, you know, the United Nations on one side, the private banks, uh, a fascinating um, impact investing private sector, um, and of course, uh, hopefully being a, a hub for conferences uh, to bring a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, and typically a, a sign of the times, um, next year uh, with Guillaume, we're, we're thinking of launching actually a venture capital fund um, linked solely to the SDGs. So not on the margins, but entirely uh, funding projects like that. So um, it's actually real uh, for those of you who are new to this space. Um, it's happening, it's really important, and we're certainly not the only ones, uh, but we're of course happy to have a conversation at our stand as well. So again, a big applause to, to uh, Maria Luisa and her team, uh, and I'm very pleased to be here.